My heart hath expected reproach and misery, and I looked for one that would grieve together with me, but there was none, and for one that would comfort me, and I found none. Today's offertory antiphon for this votive of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When studying the writings of the mystics like Sister Josefa Menendez, who received special communications from the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we find statements like this one. Always remember that if I love you, it is because you are little, not because you are good. Again, always remember that if I love you, it is because you are little, not because you are good. This is theological. We do not make ourselves good, but rather it is God loving us that makes us good. His love comes and casts out our defects and our faults and our guilt from sin. He makes us more and more lovable. He loves us first, says St. John, and then we can love him in return. This is one of the ways we know that we are in a state of grace. How do I know I'm in a state of grace? One of the ways I know is that I can love God sincerely from my heart. I can make an act of love and mean it. Then I know that I'm in a state of grace because only with grace in the heart can you make a true and sincere act of love. He loves us, then we love Him. To Sister Josefa Menendez, the Sacred Heart said, I could make a saint of you without more ado, but what I ask of you is that you should never hold out against my will. Do what I ask you to do. Let me act. Humble yourself. I will seek you out in your nothingness and unite you to myself. Think of it like this. God created the universe from nothing. He likes to work with nothing. If we become nothing, what will He do with us? Wow. We must become and remain little for God to work with us. Again, he says to Sister Josefa Menendez, found in The Way of Divine Love, beautiful book, I highly recommend it. Always remember that if I love you, it is because you are little, not because you are good. We've already said that once and we'll say it again. Always remember that if I love you, it is because you are little, not because you are good. Now we often resist God because we do not feel worthy of such love. We do not feel worthy of love itself. Infinite love. When it draws near, you feel your nothingness. When it wants to become intimate with us, we feel, I'm not worthy. So when He comes near, we feel our wretchedness, our unworthiness. Now many today, dare I say many here even, have found their way back to the church after some years of living more or less a prodigal life. What can be said of all those college years, misspent youth, this is surely one of the principal motivations for many families striving anew to homeschool their children. I don't want to happen to my children what happened to me. I don't want them to do what I did. Is that not why we have homeschooling? That's one of the reasons. But many who have found their way back all the way to tradition after such a life, can at times be rather bitter. You've met them. Or have a certain angry streak in them. 
especially toward the church or perhaps more precisely toward her leadership. It seems to me that one of the main reasons for this is simply they refuse to accept two things. First, they refuse to accept that Christ, our King, His Majesty, that God in His mysterious ways has for some reason allowed the church to go through her passion at this time. That God's allowed this. Number two, that they themselves have fallen so far into the mire when they should have known better. I can't believe I did that. As to the first, we know the church is the spotless bride of Christ, but right now she looks like Job of old. She's immobile. She seems to be paralyzed, not doing much about the evil in the world. She's covered with wounds from head to foot. She's being attacked, even by her friends. Now, traditionally and historically, she has always had many fences and barriers around her to protect her. Things like scholastic theology and philosophy, the Latin language, and the ancient liturgy and all the rituals that go along with it. This beautiful Latin Mass today. Priestly celibacy. Indissolubility of marriage. And many other like things. Things that remind us and lead us to the church triumphant. Heaven. But just as the devil was given permission to demolish the fences around Job to test him and teach us something of the mysterious ways of God, so now in God's mysterious plan, the fences around the church have been allowed to be knocked down, raised to the ground, one after the other. Consequently, the flooding revolutionary river that flows from the devil's lying mouth, as described in the Apocalypse chapter 12, has been allowed to flood the city of God with its foul and fetid waters. As a result, there have been devastating losses in the priesthood, scandals, devastating losses in religious life, an apostasy of the faithful, and many confused teachings coming from Rome and various chanceries, and many other similar things. Sadly, nearly everyone in the church over the last half century, clergy and faithful alike, have imbibed... hmm, some of these waters and have gone astray for at least a short time. Maybe they've spoken something from the pulpit they shouldn't have. Maybe they taught something in a class they shouldn't have. Maybe they held on to some false doctrine for a while, not knowing. They didn't buy the waters. Some never recover. St. Pius X liked to say, as the priest, so the people. As many priests left the priesthood, so many souls left with them, left the church, went astray. Some of these souls were our own. And those of our parents and our teachers were left wondering, why did God allow this? Why so much evil? Why so much suffering to his church? You know, Job asked these questions too. If you know the story. Despite our straying like a sheep lost at some point by the sheer grace of God, the sacred heart of Jesus, he turned toward us in a dart of love. Was sent our way and we converted. We came back. Or, as there are many young people in the pews today, they'd be preserved by the sacred heart of Jesus from falling, as St. Therese was. Still, by God's grace, sheer grace. 
Yet this is where our pride of our fallen nature rises up and easily embitters us. We look back on all the carnage of our life and wonder what went wrong. Why did I go astray? Why did I make that dumb choice? Why me? What happened to my family? Why can't I go visit those people? We can't get along. Why can't I go to any church and experience the beautiful Latin Mass? For those who have returned to tradition, the finger inevitably points to the various leaders of the church, causing them to become embittered toward priests and bishops in general, simply because they know that had the leaders of the church remained on course, then we too would not have fallen. We would have been faithful. As the priest, so the people. The fences of the church would have remained in place and I would have stayed inside. I would not have drunk deeply from those waters flowing from the devil's mouth. Although I'm not excusing those clerics and prelates who have had some part to play in ushering in the current passion of the mystical body of Christ, and there are plenty who did, I am saying such hard feelings, such finger pointing will not change what we did, what I did. I did that. It will not produce peace of soul, will not help us become little so that God will come and make us good. We must not forget Job. He was innocent, and he wondered why all these things were happening to him. He kept begging God to hear him, and finally God did answer, and Job was put to confusion. You can read about it in that precious book of the Bible. In the book it says... Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that wrappeth up sentences in unskillful words? What does that say about today's bloggers, Facebook, unskillful words? Gird up thy loins like a man, the Lord said. I will ask thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if thou hast understanding. Wilt thou make void my judgment and condemn me that thou mayest be justified? God never answered any of Job's questions. I am God. I don't have to answer your questions. This is a mystery. You need to deal with it. Accept it. Humble yourself before me. Then Job answered the Lord and said, What can I answer who has spoken inconsiderately? I have made a mistake. I will lay my hand upon my mouth. One thing I have spoken which I wish I had not said, and another to which I will add no more. Once again, beware, bloggers. I have spoken unwisely and things that above measure exceeded my knowledge. If there's one thing I've noticed when I do read some of those commentaries on the blogs, man, these people are exceeding their knowledge. Therefore, I reprehend myself and do penance in dust and ashes. Job was innocent. The Bible says in all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. We're not innocent. We're not like Job. We've sinned and we have fallen. How much more than Job do we need to be cautious about our anger for the passion of the church that His majesty, for whatever reason, has allowed to take place at this time? We should lament the sufferings of the church. We should hate sin and all its effects. We should do something about it by making reparation 
by trying to become little to please Him. That He'll find at least somebody on which He can be merciful instead of all these proud people who know more than God. But is it not true, is it not true that we are really more angry at ourselves for falling than we are at the plight of the church? I have found this to be the case. We refuse to accept our nothingness. It is much healthier and productive of peace to look at ourselves and say, I did that. I did not have to do it. But I did. No one forced me. I cannot blame the church. I cannot blame my parents. I cannot blame my wife or my husband. No, I did it freely. Look how little I am. Look at what I am capable of doing. Here it is. This is what I can do. Sin. I'm surprised I did not do worse. I'm surprised I did not sin even more and more and cause even more damage. For there is no evil of which I am not capable. That's a quote from Sister Josepha Menendez. There is no evil of which I am not capable. Ah, such a humble attitude lifts one's heart to God in thanksgiving for protecting them from themselves and worse evils. God is here. God protected me. I could have been much worse. I could have done much worse things. Thank you, God, for protecting me from myself and preventing me from worse sins. This is very pleasing to God. This humility impels God to come to us and make us good. He says, your misery attracts me. What would you do without me? Do not forget the lowlier you become, the nearer I shall be to you. A soul will profit even after the greatest sins, he says, if she humbles herself. It is pride that provokes my father's wrath and it is loathed by him with infinite hatred. Another saint says, allow God to turn your sins to fertilizer. Humble yourself. I'm nothing. We should look at ourselves and marvel that God has called us back and that we are awake and alive at this time, that we have faith, hope, and charity How gracious is our God. The Sacred Heart shows us how to respond to such a gift. To Sister Josefa Mendez, Menendez, he says we need sincere gratitude. A willingness to offer every act and trial for the love of God and the salvation of souls. By making acts of reparation and humility... And to struggle with our faults and failings without giving up. Now, here's some of his direct words. All I ask of souls is their love. But they give me only in gratitude. I should like to fill their souls with grace, but they pierce my heart through and through. How? With pride. Combat by thanking God for preserving you from yourself and untold evils. He says, many souls think that love consists in saying, my God, I love thee. No, love is sweet and acts. It acts because it loves. And all that it does is done out of love. 
I want you to love me in that way, in work, in rest, in prayer and consolation, as in distress and in humiliation, constantly giving me proofs of your love by acts. This is for you, Jesus. This is for love of you. This is true love, he says. If souls really understood this, they would advance in perfection rapidly and how greatly they would console my heart. We don't need to go out and do great things. Maybe we should if we're called to do that. But even the smallest things done with love are a consolation to the sacred heart. The soul that loves wants to suffer, wants to sacrifice, he says. For suffering, that is making sacrifices, increases love. It wants to suffer. Never does my heart refuse to forgive a soul that humbles itself. Never lose an occasion of humbling yourself. Love me in your littleness, this will console me. Jesus Christ said these things. Two last things. The Sacred Heart was greatly pleased by Sister Josepha kissing his hands and feet in reparation as well as kissing the ground and renewing her vows of religion. We can do this. Have your crucifix. We kiss our crucifixes in the hands and the feet and the side. We kiss the ground in reparation for sinners and our own sins. And we renew our baptismal vows. And at Mass... We offer to God the Father, the sacred heart of Jesus, especially saying something like, Father, is not the blood of thy Son of sufficient value? What more dost thou require? His heart, his wounds, his precious blood, he offers all for the salvation of souls and the welfare of the church. This is how to make reparation and to humble ourselves. Well, let's offer God Jesus for everything that we've done and that's going on in the world. And finally, my heart, my heart exalts in forgiving faults that are of pure frailty. You have faults? You fall because of frailty? My heart exalts in forgiving the faults that are of pure frailty. I do not ask you to free yourself from these faults, For I know it is not within your power always to do so. But what I do ask of you is to keep up the struggle against your passions. Don't give in. Don't say, well, I just can't help it. Fight. This pleases God. Now let us follow these admonitions of being grateful, humble, loving, sacrificing. Let us become little and completely dependent on His Majesty's sacred heart. And He will make us good. He will love us. And He will come. And He will make us good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.